is the way. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the truth. He is the lie. He is the lie. So what you gonna do? So what you gonna do? Cause he is the vibe. He is the vibe. He is the vibe.
The devil will throw some of you into prison to test you. You will suffer for 10 days. But if you remain faithful, even when facing death, I will give you the crown of life. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. Whoever is victorious will not be harmed by the second death. Amen. God's word, God's people. And so this church in Smyrna, it was about, uh, it's about 30, or it was located about 35 to 40 miles uh, north of Ephesus. And this church was known as the the suffering church, the persecuted church. Beloved, there is no instant gratification in suffering. We often don't see the rainbow until after the storm has passed. And oftentimes you won't see the purpose of your suffering until after you have come through it. And much like the fairy tale of the ugly Doubling. We initially don't see the beauty. It's too hard to imagine when you're in the midst of your suffering. And then when you look back over your life and you see all the things that God has done, not only do you see the beauty in the suffering, but the beauty of the Savior Amen. who is giving you a piggyback ride through your pain. And so I want to give you three takeaways from that we can learn from the church of Smyrna's suffering that we can apply to our own lives when we're going through as it starts to storm outside. Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> Point number one, your suffering is known by the Savior. Mm. Your suffering is known by the Savior. Point two, your suffering is short-lived. Your suffering short-lived. And point number three, your suffering for Christ leads to salvation. Your suffering for Christ leads to salvation. Now, if you look at point number one, you know we like to, to take the, the scripture bit by bit. That's like the, what we like to do here at Truth Life. This message, and we're going to take the, the, the from, from verse, uh, verse eight, this message it's from the one who was first and the last, who was dead and is now alive. And I just wanted to, to, to point that out because obviously Jesus, well, maybe if you didn't know, it's Jesus, right? The Alpha and Omega, yeah. right? The one who didn't have to, uh, 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 didn't have to be hazed to be in a fraternity or sorority, but he took the hazing on our behalf and, 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 and we didn't have to cross because he actually crossed when he took on the cross Amen. so that we can cross over into eternal life. The first and the last. No one can take his life. He laid down his life. He picked it back up. He died and he came back to show up that death no longer has power. Amen. That is the first and the last. And then he says, I know about your suffering. Your poverty, but you are rich. See, this church in Smyrna was poor in finances, but they were rich in character. People often say it's not about what you know, but who you know. And this church had the right connections because they were connected to the source the one true source. And if we're honest, every born again believer that came to Jesus, who was a friend of tax collectors, came to him having filed a spiritual bankruptcy. We realized that there was a debt that we could not pay back, so we called on our heavenly attorney, Jesus, who would advise us to put our faith in him and then he canceled that debt. This church of Smyrna was full of individuals who created wealth 
not from their hustle, not from their business acumen, not from their grind, not from their entrepreneurial spirit, but they created wealth by the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Storing up treasures in heaven because where your treasure is, your heart will also be. And that's not to say that you shouldn't strive for financial freedom and flexibility. That Jesus don't pull up on you like the rich young ruler and tell you to sell everything you've got and follow him. I'm not exactly saying that, but what I am saying is that we do need to do a credit check on our hearts. It's to say that the first shall be last and the last shall be first. So if we acquire our riches and our wealth by stepping on other people's toes, then get ready to be in last place later on. The church was towards the back in worldly standards. Jesus knew that and he commended them for that. The world, the kingdom of God rather is the adverse of the world. It's different from the world in that the things that the world pursues and considers great, God doesn't look at it that way. So even if you are sitting here today and you're figuring like, man, I'm, I'm behind right now. I'm not, I'm down bad. Things ain't really going the way I anticipated. Guess what? Just keep moving. Keep pushing. Yeah. Because the first will be last and the last shall be first. Jesus sees it. He's aware of it and he knows it. And then he goes on to say, I know about the blasphemy of those opposing you. They say they are Jews, but they are not. They belong to the synagogue of Satan. Now it's been speculated that this opposition could have came from the Gentiles who were posing as Jews, but they really weren't. Or actual Jews who didn't believe in Jesus. We know that Satan is a father of lies. And so his synagogue is a place that specializes in promoting blasphemy. They claim to be Jews, meaning they claim to be people of God. But they were clearly misrepresenting what it meant to be people of God. And Jesus is aware of this. But yet still, he allows for the opposition. He allows for the opposition. And I was like, wow, Lord, if you, you, you see, and, and often, you know, the argument against Christianity, followers of Jesus, is why would a good God allow for such bad things to happen? Why would God just allow for certain things to happen in my life? He didn't stop this opposition. Why? So, I, I try to do a little something, you know, working out. You know, I ain't the expert or nothing like that. But I try to, you know, stay in shape or whatnot. But for those who do, you know, you know that there's a concept called resistance training, right? And in resistance training, this training allows for you to, to, to build muscle, right? You have time under tension, right? And it allows for you to build muscle and muscle endurance. Mm -hmm. This church in Smyrna was under some resistance training. Jesus was their personal trainer. And if anybody in here is a personal trainer or has worked with a personal trainer, you know that their objective is not to necessarily be your friend, although we do have a friend in Jesus, but the objective is to get you in shape. Yeah. You might not like how it feel while you're going through it. It don't feel great. It doesn't feel amazing. But sometimes you gotta go through it. You gotta feel that resistance. You gotta feel that tension. And in essence, when that happens, you just become stronger and stronger and more flexible. That's what God is doing for this church. He wants to do that in your life too. And so we have to be receptive to some of that suffering by our personal training of Jesus. He allowed for them to resist to build their strength and endurance and to press on through the hard times of the persecution that they were going to be going through, that they are currently going through. Yeah. That brings me to point number two, your suffering is short-lived. 
He said in verse 10, don't be afraid of what you are about to suffer. The devil will throw some of you into prison to test you. You will suffer for 10 days, but if you remain faithful, even when facing death, I will give you the crown of life. If you study the epistles, or if you study the epistles and you kind of look at who these, uh, and by epistles I'm meaning the, the, uh, the, the letters in the New Testament, a lot of them Paul wrote, uh, John wrote some, Peter wrote some. If you look at who these are addressed to, oftentimes they're addressed to persecuted Christians as a way to encourage them to keep up the fight. The world that the church of Smyrna is living in was very hostile towards believers in Jesus. It's not like what exists today. I mean, yeah, there's hostility, but not like this day. Not that it was not the prominent religion. Most people didn't claim in that day and time to know God. And so they were living in a very extremely hostile environment. They were hostile towards Jesus. And so persecution, they could find it anywhere, at any time. I love, um, y'all probably want, you know, anybody who knows me, they know I love sports. One of the sports that I love is, uh, is boxing. Love boxing. Boxing is one of my favorite sports. Um, grew up watching it. My dad, I remember watching stuff with my dad. I just kind of kept watching it. You know, watching him watch different fights. You know, Mike Tyson should have read that and stuff like that. And I just kept watching those as I got older. Fell in love with the sport. And honestly, <laughs> in my heart of hearts, I would love to be a boxer. I would love to, I wouldn't mind one day getting in the ring and mixing it up a little bit, you know, just to kind of get a feel for it and see what it's like, you know, because I love the sport so much, but if, I, if I'm going to keep it real, if I'm going to be honest with you, I fear getting hit. Yeah. Right? Mm. If you step in that boxing ring, you're bound to get hit. And, and, and it's, 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 it's the punch that you don't see coming. Like, even if you see a punch coming, it's still going to hurt, right? It's still going to hurt. But the punch that you don't, you don't see coming, I'm like, man, how am I going to react to that? I'm not trying to end up no meme. I ain't trying to end up on a world star. I ain't trying to end up on nobody's internet reels. Nothing like that. How am I going to go home to my son and he see his father laid out? <laughs> I done lost consciousness. I don't want my son to have to deal with that. You can't be going to school and seeing your daddy laid out. How am I discipline my son if I'm, I'm knocked out? Right? And so I'm like, man, Lord, I, I want to try this, but I'm afraid of the hit. How am I going to react to the hit? I fear that it's not going to be a good reaction, and so therefore I'm hesitant. I don't know if I want to do this. And Jesus is telling this church in Smyrna not to be afraid about what they are about to suffer. Don't be afraid of the hit. Because your pain is temporary. Yeah. Your suffering is temporary. He told them straight up, look, some of y'all gonna go to jail. That ain't a very, that ain't a very good uh, recruiting tool, right? Some of y'all might end up in jail. Mm -hmm. In order for you to lose your life, you gotta, you gotta, you are, in order for you to gain your life, you gotta use it. This is not a very awesome recruiting tool. It's not something that you would go out to do very often if you wanna get a group of people to really be sold out on what you're trying to do. He's telling them like, listen, the devil gonna throw some of y'all in the prison. Some of y'all gonna have to go, but listen, don't be afraid because it is a test. It is a test. Don't fear the test because you have the answer to the test. Yeah. We have the answer to the test when you call on the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We have the answer to the test. And I ain't talking A God. The cross wasn't artificial. His intelligence is way high. Okay. Saved by the sun, not the bell. This ain't Bayside. <laughs> when I see him, I'm going to fall on his feet. Fall at his feet, call it FaceTime. Yeah. 
prison is basically isolation. Humans, you know, we're, we're, we're often fueled by the admiration of people. You know, sometimes when we stand up for Christ, we get thrown into like a, like a social prison, right? If we don't get the acceptance and the affirmations of your peers, you begin to feel a little less relevant. And when you start feeling less relevant, guess what? Then that's when the loneliness will start to set in. But saints, before you let depression and anxiety move into the neighborhood of your mind, know that your suffering is only temporary. Yeah. His word says, weeping may endure for a night, but Joy, man. Jesus says, you will suffer for 10 days. Mm -hmm. He puts a timeline yeah. on that suffering. He is letting us know that this is temporary. Sometimes we get so caught up in what we're going through. And it feels like, man, Lord, why is this happening? And God is like, if you just hold on, this storm will pass. Yes. If trouble don't last always, but just hold on. Don't give up. Keep going. I got you. Paul says this in his letter to the church at Philippi, chapter 1, verses 12 through 14. He says, and I want you to know my dear brothers and sisters, that everything that has happened to me here has helped to spread the good news. For everyone here, including the whole palace guard, knows that I am in chains because of Christ. And because of my imprisonment, most of the believers here have gained confidence and speak boldly God's message without fear. You, you don't see the correlation. Mm. You see the correlation? Here's the point. If our Lord and Savior is willing to go through hell for us, yes. surely we can go through a little fire for him. Yes. If our Lord and Savior is willing to go through hell, I can go through a little fire too. Yeah. I can. And we, if we're honest, we have it pretty good here in the U.S., right? In terms of being persecuted for following Jesus. I mean, very rarely, if ever, will it involve a life or death situation. Yeah, you might, you know, get into something with somebody and, you know, the words, that hit you with some words, but very rarely, you got to shed blood. It's it's, 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 it's okay. You can get over that. It was different for the church of Smyrna. Jesus says, if you were but if you remain faithful, even when facing death, I'll give you the crown of life. He brings up death. And it's like, wait a minute, hold on. There's a possibility here that I could lose my life. I'm not be. I'm cool on that. Straight up. I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to do that. In a specific example of being faithful even when facing death is the martyrdom of a gentleman by the name of Polycarp. Now, I'm, you know, no history buff, but, you know, sorry if this is boring to y'all, but it's, it's applicable. <laughs> I got to tell you about this. And so Polycarp was a bishop of Smyrna, right? This Smyrna is the, the, the subject of the church that we're talking about. He was a bishop, and he was the, uh, one of the last disciples of the Apostle John, all right? Mm -hmm. And he was actually killed for not bowing to Caesar. Similar, if not the same reason why Jesus was killed, because ultimately Caesar was Lord for the Romans. And if you did not profess Caesar as Lord, then you could lose your life. And the Jewish and the religious leaders thought, hmm, you know what? This guy claims to be Lord. He claims to be God. Guess what? We're going to tell the Romans this dude is claiming to be God. He's not praising Caesar. And guess what the penalty for that is? Polycarp died for a similar reason. And so there's this letter called the, Mart the, uh, the Martyrdom of Polycarp, which one of his followers actually uh, uh, wrote. And in this letter, it, it, it talks about how when he is pressed 
by the leaders of Rome to denounce Christ and say that Caesar is Lord. Polycarp replies like this. This is what he said. He says, 86 years I have served Christ and he never did me any wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? Mm -hmm. This man is 86 years old. He said, man, I've been serving Jesus for 86 years. He ain't never done nothing to me. How can I blaspheme the God? This is my king. He called him my king. He said, my king mm -hmm. who saved me. And because of this, he got executed. All he had to do was just say, you got me. Yeah, all right, Caesar's Lord. And he could go on about his life, the rest of his life, however God let him live. He's right there at the end, you know, <laughs> I guess, I don't know. But he could have taken the easy way out, is what I'm trying to say. He could have taken the easy way out, but instead he professed Jesus unto death. Unto death. And I'm like, wow. Wow. Because undoubtedly he was thinking this sentiment. Because what Jesus said, we talked about it earlier, whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will gain it. Paul says, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Yeah. To die is gain. And for this, based off of a, a, a scripture, the scripture that we've been reading, Jesus says that you're going to receive the crown of life for this. The crown of life. So what is the crown of life? What's the crown of life? Well, uh, uh, James says in chapter 1, verse 12, it says, God blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptation. Afterward, they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. This crown is a prize reserved for those who are really about that life. Beanie Siegel had this song called What's Your Life Like? That made me think about that. What, what is my life like? He said, what's your life like? Mine is real. What is my life like? Because that's gangster. That's real right there. That you are willing to give up your life. Lay down your life. Jesus. Yeah. And I often think to myself, man, am I, you know, am I really built like that? Mm. Am I really built like that? Like, like push pain and shove, am I really gonna lay down my life? Yeah. I would love to say. And my answer to you would be yes. I believe in all my heart and my soul, my spirit, that that answer is yes. But that is a question that we all must ask each other. If we really about this thing, if it came down to it, are we going to take the easy way out? Or are we going to stand for Jesus? If it means your life, not if it means you're going to get canceled on some social media thing, that's easy, to, that, you know, that's, that's easy to take. I mean, I don't think none of us in here are famous enough to get canceled, you know. But maybe you are. I don't know. But I'm just saying, that, you, you can deal with that. But when it becomes life or death, are we really about that? Are we about that we about that. And I'm thinking to myself, Lord, I hope so. <laughs> I hope so because that brings me to my last point, which is suffering leads to salvation. Because he says in verse 11, anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. Whoever is victorious will not be harmed by the second death. What is the second death? Well, Revelation says in 20, uh, it says in Revelation chapter 20, verse 13 through 15, the sea gave up its dead, and death and the grave gave up their dead. And all were judged according to their deeds. Then death and the grave were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death. The lake of fire is the second death. The lake of fire reserved for death and the grave, both defeated by Jesus. The devil and his angels, both defeated by Jesus. You know, one of the biggest lies that you will ever hear is that you only live once. 
Remember when Yolo was uh, popping? I don't know how many years ago that was, but he was running around screaming Yolo. And I was like, that's stupid. Yolo, you only live once. And just giving people an excuse to just do whatever it is that they want to do. Because you only get one shot at this. You only got one shot. You only get one shot. You might as well just live it up. Right? It's a lie. It's a lie. I was never, um, I've never been great at math. I'm actually pretty trash at it, to be honest. Um, God forbid, you know, when my son started needing help, I'm going to have to call him with y'all. We got some mad people in, <laughs> in the congregation today. Hey, listen. Hey, don't run me. I'm using a calculator. So, but anyway, I ain't good at it. I'm not good at math, but I do have an equation for you. I do have an equation for you. Um, and feel free to, you know, store this in your memory. Write it down if you feel led to. But here's an equation. Live once, die twice. Die once, live forever. I'm going to repeat that. Live once, die twice. Die once, live forever. What does that mean? You live once. You live your life like everything's sweet. Marry, do whatever I want, YOLO. You only live one time, right? Not only because we all going to go that way, not only will we die, but chances are when you live life like that, you don't have a relationship with Jesus, you are going to meet that second death, that lake of fire. Mm -hmm. So you will die at one time, and you will die again. Mm -hmm. The second death. Live once, die twice. Die once, meaning that if you die in your flesh, you give your life to Jesus, you come to Jesus, and allow for him to completely take over your life. You make him your Lord and your Savior. Guess what? You will die once mm. at the end of your life. But you will live forever in eternity in glory Amen. with our Lord Amen. and Savior, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Live once, die twice, die once, live forever. I got some more math for you in case, you know, you want to write this down, or you want to put it in your mind. Because my Jesus, he fed the multitude. He added bread and fish together and multiplied that by his power. My Jesus divided the scribes and Pharisees with his word. I got some more. Grace plus mercy equals my Jesus. The blood of my Jesus minus my sins equals forgiveness. Ooh. I got some more for you. My Jesus was hung on a cross, and what that cross looked like a, a, a plus sign, right? And, and, and he divided the veil at the temple, and he subtracted death and hell and the grave, and he multiplied our faith by rising on the third day with all power in his hands, which equals to our eternal life, eternal bliss with the Almighty God in the new heaven and the new earth. Yes. Beloved, your salvation will outlast your suffering. The worst thing you could do is give up. Because you aren't allowing for God to show you the beauty in what you are experiencing. We are always caught or, or, or coached to learn from our mistakes mm -hmm. and to learn from the things that we do wrong. We can learn from our suffering too. Yes. We can learn how good God is. Yes. So God, we thank you. Thank you. We thank you even in the midst of our suffering, in the midst of our pain, in the midst of what we are experiencing. We thank you. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. So if you find yourself in a place where you are suffering and you don't see a, I see a, a, a blue cloud in the sky, everything is 
things looking gray, it's looking dark. I, don't, I can't see my way out of this. If you're at that place and you need prayer, we want to pray for you. If you don't have Jesus, if you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you want some assistance with your suffering, you need some assistance, and you want to accept Jesus, we will happily pray that with you as well. As our praise worship time is about to begin, we do this thing called free worship. Um, and what that means is that we just allow for an opportunity for people to just do whatever it is that the Holy Spirit is doing in their heart. If you want to get up and walk around and pray, if you want to um, just, you know, stay in your quiet place and pray, whatever God is doing, however God is moving on your heart, however the Holy Spirit compels you, as long as it's spirit led, you're free to do so. We don't want to put any restriction on anybody. We understand if it starts going a little longer, our objective is not to make long church, but our objective is to give people an opportunity to give God praise. Yeah. And if you feel like, okay, I've done that, and I'm gonna just, it starts getting a little long for me, I'm gonna go ahead and peace out, it's cool, you can do that. But for those who feel like, I just need to stay a little bit longer, just to give a little bit more Jesus, you're free to do that too. And so we're gonna just worship God, spend some time with the Father, and let him just love on us through our suffering. Amen. Amen.
So if you see, if the, if the Holy Spirit lays on your heart, please, please, uh, you know, I don't want to I don't want to say no, but please give us time. You know, we'll so put it that way. Um, so that being said, I'm going to go ahead and give the benediction and then we're, we're, we're done. So Father God, Lord, I thank you. Thank you, God, for allowing us to see the rainbow after the storm. Because that rainbow is a symbol that you will never flood the earth and destroy it in that way again. And you give us individual rainbows after we come through our storm to say, hey, you come through this and you can trust me that I will bring you through. So we thank you, Father. If we're in the midst of a storm, if we come out of a storm, if we're heading into a storm and we're heading into suffering and we're headed into some form of persecution, we know that that is only temporary and that your salvation outlasts our suffering. We thank you, God. Now as we leave from this place, Father, please keep, up, keep us under your watch and your care. Let angels camp around each and every one of us as we go through our respective uh, destinations and our careers and our schooling and just be with us, Lord. Dismiss us in peace.